This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. Well, while I watch your interview, because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. And I did no due diligence. Told I have something I'd like to sell. <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world. Is that right? <laughs> Dr. Vivek Morthy is the Surgeon General of the United States, a position to which he was appointed by President Biden. He previously was appointed and held the same position under President Obama. Recently, I had a chance to sit down with Dr. Morthy discuss a number of health issues affecting the United States, including COVID-19 and mental health. I'm here today with Dr. Vivek Morthy, who is the Surgeon General of the United States. Thank you very much for giving us this time. Of course, David. I'm glad that we're having this conversation. I am sorry that I can't do this in person with you, but as you probably heard, I did come down with COVID. I managed to dodge it for two years. Uh, I don't know what happened, but I guess my luck ran out. Uh, but is COVID still a major problem in the United States? People like me are still getting it? Well, David, first, I'm sorry that you have COVID. I, I, from personal experience, I know that, uh, you know, can, can, it's a serious thing. And even though you're vaccinated and everything, sometimes you can have these breakthrough infections and have mild symptoms. So I wish you the best in your recovery. Uh, but, you know, as a country, here's where we are. You know, we have certainly come a long way in the last couple of years. Uh, I still remember very clearly in March, of 2020, <clears throat> when more and more people were getting sick, when hospitals were starting to fill up, we were seeing terrible scenes from New York City in the months that followed. Uh, and we didn't know a lot about the virus and we didn't really have treatments and much less vaccines. Fast forward now to you know, a couple of years uh, forward, and we actually have these vaccines that are incredibly effective at keeping people out of the hospital and saving their lives. Uh, even if you do get an infection after a vaccine, again, the likelihood of you having a really bad outcome, like being in the hospital or dying from this virus, are much, much lower. And you combine that with the treatments that we now have available, treatments like Paxlovid, uh, and you find that <clears throat> most deaths in, uh, from COVID-19 should be preventable uh, at this point. So that is a long way to come from where we were. With that said, we are still losing uh, several hundred people, three to 400 people a day uh, to COVID-19, uh, and they tend to be predominantly individuals who are not up to date on their vaccines or who haven't received treatment. So we still have more work to do, and especially with the winter coming, we've seen the last couple of years there's been an increase in cases during the winter. So that's why we want people to be up to date with their vaccines. We've got an updated vaccine right now, in fact, that is tailored for the new Omicron variant, BA5. Uh, we want people to get that uh, and to make sure they have maximal protection uh, when winter comes. Well, let me ask you, in the early part of the uh, COVID, vaccine, uh, COVID problem, people were dying in enormous numbers in the United States. I think maybe now maybe more than a million people have died in the United States, maybe five million around the world. Uh, was that in part because they weren't vaccinated and the vaccination has made those who get it like me um, not as weak as we would have been without the vaccination? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So early on, before we had a, a vaccine, you know, people didn't have real protection against this virus. They didn't have prior infection with COVID-19. This is a new uh, coronavirus that had emerged on the scene. Uh, but now, thankfully, uh, those vaccines do give protection against the worst outcomes of COVID. And this is actually an important point to underscore, which is, what is the goal of a vaccine? Sometimes people think if I get vaccinated and then I get sick, that means the vaccine didn't work. But it turns out the most important goal of the vaccine is to save your life. And by that measure, it's actually doing a remarkable job. To keep the protection that people have, though, it's important for them to stay updated with their vaccines. And we've seen that over time that the COVID vaccine, like many other vaccines, that its effectiveness can wane over time, which is why just like you get a tetanus booster or you get an annual flu shot, uh, it's important to be up to date with your COVID uh, vaccines as well. So the bottom line is these are life-saving tools that we now have, the vaccines and the treatments. And by you know, depending on what calculation you look at, we have saved hundreds of thousands of lives in the United States alone because of the vaccination being available and the vaccination campaign that was mounted to get people protected. Now, did you ever get COVID? I did get COVID, yes. In fact, um, in earlier this year, uh, in early in 2022, my wife and my two kids and I all got COVID and we actually know how it happened. Uh, it turns out my daughter, who is four years old, 
and was in pre-kindergarten uh, at the time, uh, she ended up um, catching uh, the virus from somebody in her classroom. Uh, it's really challenging, you know, if you're a family, especially a family with small children, uh, to prevent yourself from getting infected. It's worth trying, and we certainly did, you know, as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you're taking care of your child. You've got to hold and comfort them when they're ill, and that puts you at, at risk, you know, if you've got small kids. And many parents have experienced this. So uh, thankfully, we were all... Uh, you know, vaccinated, except my daughter at the time, there was not a vaccine yet uh, for kids her age. Uh, but the rest of us were vaccinated. Thankfully, we had a mild course of illness. But uh, it gave me, you know, even more respect um, uh, for this virus as something that should be taken seriously. Uh, because, again, even with the protection we had, you know, we were knocked out for several days there. Now, did you tell your four-year-old daughter that she had infected the Surgeon General of the United States, and did she recognize the consequences of that? Oh, well, to my daughter, I'm just uh, her dad, who she sometimes pays attention to when her mom's not around. So <laughs> I'm not sure she's so aware of, um, of what I do. But, you know, it was also, to your point, David, it was just a very humanizing moment. You know, like I had been working on COVID for, you know, the better part of, uh, you know, a year uh, at that point. Um, but, you know, to... To be able to go through uh, this you know, experience as well just gave me, gave me even more understanding and empathy for folks out there who are not just getting sick, but who are trying to manage uh, their family responsibilities uh, while they're ill, whether it's getting their kids you know, you know, you know, to school, whether it's making sure that they're managing work, whether it's taking care of elderly relatives. Um, uh, the ripple effects of getting sick are significant, and, uh, and that was certainly something that I you know, have kept with me ever since I was ill. Let me ask you about what it means to be the Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, you're not a surgeon and you're not a general. So why are you called the Surgeon General? What is the Surgeon General's job? And one of the jobs of the Surgeon General, and the reason, in fact, why I wear this uniform, is to oversee the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. This is one of the eight uniformed services in the United States government. It consists of 6,000 officers who are dedicated to improving public health each and every day. Uh, in their day jobs. But we also deploy them during times of emergency. So uh, we send them when there are hurricanes and tornadoes that hit towns. We will send officers there to help provide uh, basic care. And routinely during COVID-19, we've deployed thousands of officers to help with everything from vaccinations to supporting healthcare systems. So that is one of the jobs of the Surgeon General. Uh, the other job, though, is to inform the public uh, about critical public health issues that arise. And this could be informing them about how to prevent uh, yourself from getting sick, how to manage an illness when it arises. Certainly with COVID, that has been an important part of my work. Uh, but increasingly, my focus has been on the broader issues of mental health and well-being, uh, which have taken a hard hit during the COVID pandemic, but which were a real struggle for our country even before then. You were the Surgeon General under President Obama, and you served under President Obama and did a very good job. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then uh, President Obama left office after eight years, and uh, President Biden came in four years later, and then he asked you to be Surgeon General again. Did you tell him you'd already done that job once, and why did you want to do it again? And were you <laughs> surprised that, that, that they wanted you to do the same job again? Well, gosh, it's an interesting question. I certainly had not planned uh, to come back and, and serve as Surgeon General again. I I, you know, I had always told myself when I had the privilege of serving the first time that this was a once in a lifetime experience. I, I didn't know it would be a twice in a lifetime experience. But you know, the pandemic really scrambled everyone's lives, including mine. While it wasn't in a, a difficult decision when he asked me to serve, and it was certainly a big decision. It, was, it had big implications for my family, certainly, and I was aware of that having served the time before. But I'll tell you, David, it was one of those moments where, in the throes of a crisis that was upending our country and the world, you know, I felt that it was my responsibility and our collective responsibilities to all do as much as we could uh, to address this crisis. I was being given an opportunity to uh, serve and hopefully to help, you know, at a larger scale, and I wanted to, to make sure I did that. What was in the he my head at that time, David, was uh, really the voice of my, of my parents and really the, the example that they had set for me when I was growing up, uh, which they set, again, more through what they did rather than what they said. But they had always sort of taught me through their actions that whenever your community is in need, 
it is our responsibilities uh, to step up and do as much as we can. It might only be a little that we can do in that moment, but all of us have to step up uh, and serve in some way. So let's talk about your parents and your background. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Miami, Florida. Uh, we moved there when I was three years old. Uh, I went to public schools, you know, all throughout high, uh, through high school. And uh, my parents, uh, they, they ran a medical practice there uh, that my uh, dad and mom had set up when I was in elementary school. And, uh, and that sort of was a pivotal uh, sort of experience for me because I spent a lot of time there as a kid and it shaped my excitement and interest for pursuing medicine later in life. And were both your parents medical doctors? So my father is a doctor. He's a family medicine doctor. Uh, my mother actually did her degree in English literature, uh, but we like to say that she's uh, an inherent healer herself uh, because it comes naturally to her. And as somebody who ran my dad's clinic for many years there, the patients in the clinic all came to know her and to trust her. So did you always want to be a doctor when you were in elementary school and high school? Did you know that was your calling? Well, I, I was really inspired by my parents early on uh, to become a doctor. And that's, you know, for much of uh, grade school, that was pretty clear that that's what I wanted to do. But toward the end of high school, uh, things changed a little bit. I started to get really interested in English literature. Uh, I got really interested in history and in economics as well. And I went to college thinking that I might want to pursue something in one of those three fields. So I took classes in, you know, in economics and in history and was uh, you know, really trying to get a sense of whether uh, that would be my path. But what happened actually in between was interesting that just shifted things for me which is that my freshman year, my father called me and he said, you know, there's this philanthropist uh, who is looking for a cause that he wants to support, but he doesn't know what the cause is. So he said, if you have any ideas that you want to work on, there may be an opportunity for you uh, to build something with his support. And I thought about it and I had actually been working on some HIV projects when I was in high school and uh, had been visiting India where my family is originally from and realized actually after high school that the crisis there was really exploding. So my sister and I ended up developing an idea to build a education program around HIV in India that would be a peer education program. This is, it's commonplace now, it was more unusual then, but the idea of bringing uh, you know, peers together to, and training them to actually go out and, and inform college and high school students around the community was novel then uh, in India, but it's something that we decided we wanted to try to build. And that was the project we ultimately were able to get funding for uh, we built that, ran it for eight years, built chapters around India and the United States as well. And that changed my perception and my, my feeling about what I wanted to do in the world. And it brought me back to health and to wanting to not only become a doctor, but to, to build programs in communities that would hopefully have a, a large scalable impact on public health. I assume you were a reasonably good student in high school. I think you were valedictorian of your class. Is that right? Uh, yes, guilty as charged. And so did you want to go to Harvard? Was that your first choice, which is where you went to, to school? Well, the reason I actually came to learn a little bit about Harvard is I had my best friend in high school, Miriam. Miriam went to this, uh, she was interested in going to this summer school program at Harvard. We all ended up going to this Harvard summer school program between junior and senior year. And it was a really wonderful experience, but that's what actually made me think, hey, maybe this would be a great place to come to college if I'm you know, lucky enough to have the opportunity. So uh, that's why I applied to Harvard. I was uh, fortunate to, to be given uh, an opportunity to attend uh, and I had a great experience there. And then after Harvard, you went to medical school at Yale? I did, I did, yeah. And how did you happen to pick Yale as a place to go? You got tired of Cambridge? <laughs> well, this is, a, this is also an interesting experience. It was, um, you know, I actually wanted to go to Harvard Medical School because I was doing research there when I was in college and I had, you know, just decided for myself that that was the right place for me to be, um, even though I didn't have exposure to other institutions. And um, it turned out I did not get into Harvard Medical School. Uh, and I was, I still remember coming home uh, on, on this day and opening the letter and seeing that it was a rejection. And I was so crushed. And I called my father and he said, um, said to me, he's like, I know you're really upset about this, but something good uh, will come of this because you'll be able to go somewhere else and get a different kind of exposure. This is going to help you grow. And I was uh, fortunate to, to you know, be given a chance to attend Yale. It became one of the most powerful educational experiences of my life, not just because of what I learned in the classroom, but because of these incredible relationships that I built and this community that I was part of and that I continue to still feel like I'm a part of even many years after the fact. So have you ever seen the admissions officer from Harvard Medical School and told him that he missed on the two-time Surgeon General? Oh gosh, no, no, I haven't. But I know that there's, look, there's, 
a degree of, uh, of randomness, number one, to admissions processes. And I always uh, tell young people now who are going to school that you should never like assume that whether or not you get into a school or not is a measure of your worth and your value. Because again, having now served on admissions committees, I know that there's a degree of randomness. There are good people who don't get in and they're uh, you know, and, and that's just the way it is. Many people in your class at Harvard went into something also important called private equity. Uh, <laughs> you were never tempted by that? Well, you know, I was interested in, in a lot of things, uh, David. You know, after I finished my residency program, I actually ended up taking uh, some time and building a company, a technology company that I ran for with uh, some colleagues for about seven years uh, to help use technology to actually advance uh, clinical research and clinical trials in particular. So I've always had an interest, uh, you know, in uh, in building businesses and in, in building, taking innovations that could actually help people and bring them to scale. Uh, so, you know, who knows what the future holds, uh, but, uh, uh, and maybe one day I'll come get some advice from you, David. What advice would you have for a young person who says, I want to aspire to a career like yours? Find a problem that you care about and try to help address it in whatever small way you can. Today, what do you consider the biggest health challenge facing the United States and the people in the United States? You know, it's a great question. I mean, there, there are so many challenges we're dealing with. Obviously, we're still uh, dealing with the pandemic and we need to be make sure that we're you know, prepared for the next one that may come uh, down the line. We have a whole bevy of chronic illnesses that people are struggling with from obesity to heart disease. Uh, but the one that's actually most on my mind uh, and, and which I'm most deeply concerned about that I see as foundational to our health is actually the mental health crisis that we have in our country. Uh, it turns out that when you struggle with your mental health, uh, as certainly I have at points in my life and I've taken care of many patients over the years who struggle with their mental health, but when you struggle with your mental health, it doesn't just impact how you feel. It impacts your physical health as well. It impacts how you show up at work. It can impact productivity, absenteeism in the workplace. And it also impacts how our children perform in school and how they learn. And so however you cut it, I think of our mental health as the fuel that allows us to show up uh, for our family and friends, for you know, our community. And when our mental health is negatively impacted, it compromises uh, you know, all those fronts. And that's what we're dealing with right now. You know, if you look at the numbers, uh, David, they're, they're really staggering, especially among youth. You know, right, you know, if you look at the population overall, about 5% uh, of people in 2020 uh, con had suicidal ideations. They contemplated taking their own life. Uh, you look at kids in particular, and you see that there was a 57% increase in the suicide rate in the 10 years preceding the pandemic, and things have gotten more challenging for many kids. Now, when I worked in the White House for President Carter, his wife, Rosalind Carter, headed a mental health task force. And it was seen, seen at the time as somewhat unusual for a first lady to be interested in that subject. And in part, She'd always been interested in it, and she uh, recognized there was a stigma attached to mental health. Now we're 45 years later, but do you think there is still a stigma attached to mental health as opposed to physical health problems? Well, I do, David. Uh, I think it's gotten better, certainly, than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. But I still see that stigma all the time. I see it, one, in the conversations I have with people, especially it's a stronger stigma in uh, my generation and older generations, younger generations are less affected by it, but there too, I still see a reluctance to talk about uh, you know, needing help and about being a bully or being the victim of, of abuse, uh, which contributes to mental health struggles. Uh, but the other piece I think it's important is it's not just in our words and actions that I see that stigma. I see it actually structurally as well. You look at how we reimburse for mental health care uh, in, in our country. And despite passing in 2008, uh, a mental health parity law, uh, that law has been unevenly enforced and it needs to be stronger. So it's harder for people to actually get mental health care in our system than it is for them to get you know, care for their physical health issues. So we, we still have a long way to go to close that gap. Are, are there mental health problems with people at work? Uh, in other words, um, if, if you're working remotely, are you gonna be more lonely and is that gonna cause a bigger problem? And do you think it's better for the mental health of people to actually be coming back to the offices and so forth? Oh, this is such a good question. And I do think that our workplaces have a really powerful effect on our mental health and well-being. It's one of the reasons I just issued a Surgeon General's framework on workplace mental health and well-being. Uh, because right now, you know, almost 80% of people are saying there's some aspect of the workplace that has contributed negatively to their mental health and well-being. But 
and around 81% of people actually want to find a workplace that supports mental health. So this is our chance to really figure out how to make uh, workplaces engines for mental health and well-being, and I've laid out a strategy for how to do that. But when it comes to working from home, this is an important consideration. There's some benefits to people from working from home. Uh, they can actually be there more for their family. Uh, they can, uh, many people can actually be home uh, for, for dinner time or drop their kids off from school. They're not spending as much time commuting. They can have more time with family and friends. That's an important positive. Uh, on the downside, when it, you know, it might, it's harder, I think, to connect with your coworkers uh, when you're not having some in-person time. So there's a balance to be struck here. And what I suggest that workplaces do often uh, is to have conversations with your employees about how to strike that balance, about how to have some time where they may be able to gather in person to, to collaborate, to come to know one each other more deeply, to build stronger working relationships, uh, that in-person in time is invaluable. But uh, this is not black and white. You know, finding that right balance is important because we know when people are satisfied and fulfilled outside of work, it has a huge impact, positive impact on their mental health. And that positively impacts their productivity and their creativity in the workplace. So it's a win-win. I'm part of the baby boomer generation, and this generation is now increasingly dealing with problems relating to uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, and so forth. Uh, not particularly my age, but maybe some people my age, even younger, but obviously in their late 70s, 80s, and 90s, more and more we, we're reading about Alzheimer's. Is this uh, an epidemic that you can't really deal anything about, or is it something we could deal with in some way? It's a real challenge for a lot of families, mine included. You know, I have a 90-year-old grandmother at home who's struggling uh, with dementia, and uh, providing care for her has been a real challenge. And for my family, we love her dearly. We want to be there for her, but where it's painful for us to see the toll dementia has taken on her. Uh, so uh, this is a rightfully, uh, you know, a concern uh, for for families across the country. We're investing a lot in studying dementia to not just Alzheimer's but other forms of dementia to understand what's driving it. But very interestingly, there's also uh, some research that's taking place, lifestyle research, if you will, on the impact. Uh, of diet, of social connection, of physical activity uh, and sleep on uh, dementia as well. Uh, Dean Ornish, a uh, professor at the University of California in San Francisco, uh, has been actually one of the uh, key folks you know, who has been leading some of that research on the impact of lifestyle and dementia. Uh, and you know, this is a promising area, but uh, I certainly think this is, we should expect this should be, this is gonna be concern for families across America uh, in the future. And just keep in mind, it's not just about the people who are impacted by dementia. It's about their families as well. It impacts, when you look at like what pulls people away from work, uh, what makes it harder for them uh, to be there for their community, it's often caregiving responsibilities. And the caregiver burnout crisis in America is real, and, and dementia is a big part of that. For a young person who says, I want to be the next Surgeon General of the United States or someday grow up to be Surgeon General, what advice would you have for a young person who says, I want to aspire to a career like yours? What would you say, go to medical school, um, uh, do what? Find a problem that you care about and try to help address it in whatever small way you can. And don't be limited by the amount of training you have or the experience that you have. You know, you, in a lot of times, what I found early in life is when I began my first nonprofit organization, I was, uh, I was 17 years old uh, at the time. I didn't know a lot uh, about a whole lot of things, and I made a lot of mistakes uh, as my sister and I tried to build this entity. But we learned a lot along the way, and what we lacked in experience and in education we made up for and enthusiasm and a willingness to learn. Uh, and so I would just encourage young people to look for, find a problem you really care about and start trying to address it in whatever small way you can. Maybe it's on your own, maybe it's in a community organization, but start trying to help right away. Don't wait until you're done with your education. Mm -hmm.